All right, I have 10 a.m. SLT, and Chantel and Jess said that um, I can start anytime I want. And my cue, are we ready to roll? Are we recording? Okay, I'm going to start, and then if there's a problem, you let me know. Okay, great, Sintel says we're ready to go. So um, I'm honored to be the first speaker of the new season. I don't know about you, but I missed uh, the Science Circle presentations. It's always a fun way to spend Saturday afternoon. just didn't seem the same, okay, with, without them. All right, but um, today I want to talk about mass extinctions of the fossil record. Uh, I'm going to be sharing uh, some research that I did this summer around um, Virginia. Uh, not only did I do a lot of field work this summer, I went to about four or five different locations within Virginia to try and get information on this topic. I also did considerable reading. Uh, I read a PhD dissertation at Virginia Tech that had a lot of data in it. Uh, the other thing I would really recommend is Alicia Steigel at Ohio State University is doing some very cool work as well on mass extinctions and environmental science. And, and I want to say, by no means am I an environmental scientist. I'm more of a geologist and paleontologist. But I, I see um, the, soul, the whole field of paleontology is going in that way. And it is a new avenue of study for us. So this is a presentation. I'm going to just list uh, the five mass extinctions. Some people think there's a sixth. Um, and then I want to focus uh, primarily on the late Ordovician event, as that's where most of my field work has focused. The other thing that I want to say from the, very, from the outset is uh, this summer I had the opportunity to go to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, you may have heard that there's a brand new exhibit that they opened up called the Deep Time Exhibit. And if you are able to get to D.C., and I know we're all over the planet, but if you are able to make your way to D.C., it's well worth the time to go through that exhibit. Um, I thought they did an excellent job. They talked about the mass extinction events. Um, not only was I able to go through the exhibit, I also was able to meet with several of the curators uh, after lunch and go into their collections area. And I got permission from the Smithsonian Institution just this past week to share some fossils from the collections in this presentation. So I appreciate them allowing me to do that. Uh, I don't have a lot of specimens, but I do have some. And I'm hoping I've talked to Chantel and Jess about doing um, another presentation later in the fall, talk more about some of the collections that are, some of the specimens that are available in those collections. So without further ado, uh, Let's get into the talk. The other thing I want to say, by the way, before I forget, um, real informal, if you have a question, if you have a comment, um, we, we can't do voice. Uh, you can't do voice, but feel free to put a question or comment in chat. I have the local chat open. I'll be happy to stop at any point and uh, try and answer your question as best as I can. I'm by no means an expert on all the mass extinctions, but I will try and do the best that I can. So my interest in the mass extinction of the fossil record probably goes back to the 1980s uh, when I was doing my PhD dissertation at the University of Chicago. And back in the 80s, um, Chicago was the hotbed, I think, of, of paleo, paleontology and paleobiology that was going on. Uh, there were people like Dave Rapp, uh, Tom Schaaf, Jack Sipkowski that were really doing groundbreaking work. They, they were compiling huge amounts of data on, on the fossil record and then trying to look at uh, patterns of the, of the fossil record. Uh, Jack Sipkowski was my evaluator for a while. And here's one of the graphs that I got out of a textbook that was shame, shamelessly ripping him off. It's one of the ones, unfortunately, that I use in my earth science class. Um, and it shows Jack's uh, data on the number of families versus geologic time. And Jack documented five main mass extinction events, which I'm going to list in a minute. Uh, some of us are very familiar with the terminal Cretaceous one, in which the dinosaurs went out. Maybe the Permian one. 
Um, I was surprised to learn uh, from Dr. Sapkowski that there were actually three other events, one at the end of the Ordovician about 450 million years ago, one at the end of the Devonian about uh, 350 million years ago, and one at the end of the Triassic. Uh, when I was at the Smithsonian Institution, one of the things that I thought was interesting was that the scientists at the Smithsonian had another mass extinction event, one at the end of the Vendian, which is not discussed much, about 543 million years ago. Uh, those of you that came to hear uh, uh, to the panel discussion with Alex Hasting and myself, and also we were fortunate to get Shuhai Zhao to come on Second Life. He talked a lot about the uh, pre-Cambrian to Cambrian transition. Uh, the Vendian was at the very end of the pre-Cambrian. And if you can sort of zoom in on this, it shows uh, some of this is a fossil from the Smithsonian of actual Vendian animals. They're very enigmatic. Um, when, you, when you get in these late Precambrian faunas, it's not even clear what the heck you're looking at. Um, but uh, you see the fossil on the left and a reconstruction of what the animal may have been like. They sort of resemble ferns or plants, but they're actually animals. Very simple organisms where probably all they did was uh, uh, extract nutrients from the, from the water. But uh, at the end of the Vendian, at the end of the Precambrian, uh, you see this rapid shift from very simple organisms to uh, first invertebrates, the first more complicated things that are coming into the oceans. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution has suggested that uh, if there was a terminal Vendian extinction event, it may be biotically produced. In other words, that the things that were coming out in Cambrian may have just displaced uh, some of the Precambrian organisms. And that's one theme that I see going on in, uh, in paleontology, that uh, people are starting to imply, apply environmental science concepts to deep time. So paleontologists are starting to look at, for example, um, invasive species and what event they had. And uh, I'm going to say a lot more about that later on in the period. But there seems to be some interesting uh, inter interactions that are going on. All right, then we have the terminal Ordovician extent uh, event um, about 444 million years ago. And one of the things that Jack Sapkowski always used to say is there, there are always organisms, there are always species that are dying out. Um, this, he called it a background extinction event. So you always have a couple of them going out every couple of million years. But there are times in the geologic past where the extinction rates were greatly exaggerated. Uh, the end of the Ordovician, some 86% of the species that were around passed away. So we start losing uh, graptolites uh, that are shown on the top slide here. Um, the picture at the bottom is a, is a brachiopod from the Smithsonian. Um, these sort of flat-shelled strophomia brachiopods, they take a major hit at the end, end of the Ordovician, but they don't entirely go out. Uh, they get replaced later on in the Devonian time period. And some of the, uh, the reasons for this extinction event may be due to glaciation that occurred in South Africa. Uh, like I said, I'm going to say a lot more about this terminal Ordovician extinction event uh, as we go through here. But let's list some of the other parts of the other major extinction events. Uh, there was one that occurred during the late Devonian about 375 million years ago, some 75% of the species uh, perished. Uh, we see some bizarre trilobites going out, like the, the illustration of the slide at the top. Um, there are also these winged spiriferids uh, that I love collecting. In fact, these were some of the first brachiopods I collected in the bottom part of the slide here. About 30, gosh, it's been 40 years since I started collecting fossils. Um, and they don't appear anywhere else in the fossil record, um, uh, these, these weird things. And the question is, what may have caused that? Well, again, there are some suggestions that perhaps nutrients were released in the oceans. These nutrients allowed algae to bloom, that, which may have uh, depleted oxygen levels, uh, suffocating bottom dwelling organisms. Again, it's sort of hard to tell. Um, because, you know, this sort of chemistry is rarely preserved in the fossil record. Although we do get um, some 
black shales, which are typical of, of low oxygen conditions um, in the Devonian. All right, then we go on to the term terminal Permian extension, which, which was about 250 million years ago. Um, almost, it almost drained the oceans. This is the one that's perhaps one of the most famous marine extinction events. 96% of the species died away. Uh, some of the animals that, that perished uh, include uh, the horned corals, the tabulate corals. Uh, all the trilobites die out at this point. The brachiopods get a major hit. There are these weird uh, brachiopods that have spines to them They're called reductants. They go out. And uh, the, the cause of this extinction debate, the cause of this extinction event have debate, been debated heavily. When I was in graduate school, the, the predominant uh, deterministic factor behind it was uh, plate tectonics. So we thought that uh, what happened was that Africa and North America came up, up together. In fact, all the continents collided to form the supercontinent known as Pangaea. Um, and as that, that collision event occurred, the uh, sea level dropped as mid-ocean ridges collapsed. Um, Continental shells were drained, so all these marine organisms all of a sudden really had no place to go. Um, I mean, well, I mean, the options were either they'd go in deep water. Some crinoids were able to do that. Some organisms came on land, for example, snails. And, and you see that this time period, the first amphibians are starting to come out um, on the land. But most organisms just could not adapt um, and just perished. Uh, since the 80s, there have been a number of other theories that have been proposed as to why this was such a terrible time for mass extinction events. Um, we do know that there is a massive uh, crater um, in Africa, so there was a collision event at that time uh, that could have had some impact on uh, life that existed back then. Uh, we also know that there were major volcanic eruptions that were occurring in Siberia. Um, those eruption events could have uh, produced uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, very much like today, that may have had an effect, effect on the atmosphere. Uh, in fact, the Smithsonian uh, Deep Time exhibit makes a major point of saying that if it could happen 250 million years ago and wipe out and drain that many, um, drain the ocean of that many organisms, it could certainly happen again today. Oh, yeah, the, the Earth is 4.56 billion years old. All right, then we go on to the Triassic event, first age of dinosaurs. And uh, you have these weird organisms called conodonts um, that, are, that were very common in the uh, Triassic. Actually, they were also common throughout the Paleozoic as well, but a lot of them die out. And for years, paleontologists debated what the heck a conodont was. And then finally, we found the whole conodont animal. I think it was over in Germany. And it was this eel-like organism uh, that existed uh, with all these teeth. Um, but again, um, you know, the question is, why would so many organisms perish, okay, at the end of the Triassic? And the and, and not many people know, but um, we think it may be due to, due to volcanoes um, that released gases like carbon dioxide, sulfur trioxide. Uh, combined with water that entered in the oceans, it might have made the ocean somewhat more acidic, um, would have made more difficult, certainly, for uh, calcium carbonate-producing organisms to survive. All right, now we get to, by far, the most famous of the mass extinction events, the terminal Cretaceous. 66 million years ago, about 76% of all the species uh, on land, in the air, and in the water perish. So, of course, this we tend to think that when we think of this uh, extinction event, we think of things like Triceratops, that's the last known dinosaur dying out. Uh, there were a lot of uh, hadrosaurs or these duck-billed dinosaurs that also perished at the end of the event. Uh, we know in the oceans, this was a time when um, organisms like big uh, or inocerbid clams uh, pass away. Uh, there were many organisms in the um, um, microorganisms in the plankton that passed away. Uh, you have 
things, squid-like organisms called scaphides uh, that pass away. This was an event that hit every trophic level, every sort of ecologic group. Um, it spared very few organisms. The only things that made it through uh, the terminal Cretaceous were be small mammals. Uh, some birds were able to make it through. Um, there are some some organisms in the oceans that survive. Uh, the most, and then there's, of course, the most likely impact since the 1980s has been uh, an impact of an object from space. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the paper that was published in the 1980s, where some rare earth uh, geochemists uh, studied iridium and osmium at the yeah the uh, thank you Vic the Alvarez team. Um, some reason that scientists came out of my brain. Uh, the Alvarez team proved that there were high levels of iridium osmium right at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, um, and that those iridium osmium, osmium levels uh, were a biochemical fingerprint of some sort of impact event. What's interesting is um, that the original model of the Alvarez team was you have this object that comes in and slams into the earth and produces a dust cloud and uh, that would have blocked out the app, the sunlight and would have killed off the, the plants, which would have killed off the, um, uh, the plant-eating dinosaurs, which in turn would have killed off the carnivores. That was the original ecologic model that uh, Alvarez's team came up with. However, what's interesting is in the 1990s, they finally tracked down where the, uh, where the impact event was. And this was a very, very clever sort of detective story because for years people were looking for the crater and they just couldn't find it. I mean, there are plenty of them on the earth, but we just, we couldn't find the right size, we couldn't find the right age. And then somebody said, why don't we measure the clay layer at the end of the Cretaceous where it's the thickest, that's probably closest to the impact event. And they found out that the thickest uh, clay layer was in the Caribbean. So they intensified their search around there and they finally found it between the coast of the, uh, Honduras and Cuba, I believe. It was underwater and covered with sediment. Um, what's interesting is people started to look at the impact site and what they found recently, and this is not even in the Smithsonian deposits, only come out in the latest publication, is that that object slammed into gypsum. I mean, it was the worst possible impact site because it slams into gypsum and gypsum uh, as I'm waiting for Mike to, to talk, tell us about this, is calcium sulfate. So calcium sulfate becomes vaporized by the impact event. So you're producing large amounts of sulfur into the atmosphere, which mixes with water, and you're raining down sulfuric acid. So it must have been a very dangerous environment, high temperatures. Um, they actually had a picture of the impact site or the uh, terminal Cretaceous a uh, tertiary event in um, at the Smithsonian, and you can see the thin clay layer, and then right on top of it, they've got a layer of charcoal. So just everything started to burn, okay, um, as a result of this event. Uh, we also know that there were volcanoes that were erupting. If you look at India, at the Deccan Traps, um, large amounts of sulfur gas have been produced as well from those. Uh, temperatures might have actually dropped during this time as a result of uh, accumulation of dust and other materials um, around the, the planet. And I see a bunch of comments that are coming in from Baragon. Okay, again, if you, so as you can see where major cities were at any one time on Earth's history. All right, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, throw them into local chat. All right, so those are the five to six you know, depending upon how you want to count them, uh, mass extinction events that have been documented um, in the uh, the fossil record. Uh, last year, last spring, towards the end of the uh, of the uh, presentations on Science Circle, uh, Chantel gave me time to give a tour of the museum, uh, the geology museum that Science Circle has very generously provided me uh, the location on that. I greatly appreciate it. And in the second floor, I talked quite a bit about nomothetic versus ideographic geology and paleontology and science. And for those of you that couldn't make it, let me give a, 
a brief summary of what I meant uh, by those terms before we go on, because I think it's really important. Um, geology and paleontologists, when they first got started a couple hundred years ago, and I guess you could even trace it back to times of the Greeks, I mean, they studied fossils as well, to be sure, um, were really just trying to go out, and, oh, here's a cool fossil, and they would describe it, and then they would draw a picture of it, and they'd try and publish it. Um, and that really is a good starting point. You know, what else are you going to do other than, you know, simple descriptions? And over the years, we've accumulated thousands of fossils now um, that are well described and uh, classified, which is good. Um, the latest work, though, since I would say about the 1970s and 80s, there's been an attempt, especially by people like, let's pick Steve Gould, who I think was first to really coin the term nomothetic geology. Uh, and he said that it's not enough to just go out and find a cool-looking fossil and document it, describe it, and publish it. Uh, what you need to do is think about what is the bigger implications? How does this fall into our, our bigger understanding of maybe it's evolution or plate tectonics, okay, or geologic processes um, in time? Uh, and thanks, Mike, for throwing up uh, some more information about uh, the uh, – the calcium uh, hydroxide spray. Um, and I think Steve Gould was absolutely correct in that term. And I've, I, I gotta admit, it's, it's a transition that I had made. Uh, I first started with fossil collecting in 1972. And that's all I did was put together a collection, describe and classify it. And then after going through Chicago, I realized, no, the better thing to do is try and look at, you know, what some of the, you know, how does it fit in this sort of bigger picture, right? And um, so one of the places I love to go in Roanoke is, or in Virginia, is Catawba Mountain. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Virginia, Catawba Mountain is just a few miles west of Roanoke, Virginia. Um, here's a picture of uh, the area. It's really a pretty scenic site. And I was telling Chantel this summer that I was going to be doing a number of field trips. And he goes, oh, please put some scenery pictures in it. So this is... Chantel, here you go. This is one of the best shots that I've got of Catawba Mountain. It is it, nothing to do with geology, okay, but uh, it is, is it is a pretty area to work in. Um, and usually you go into the mountains, it's, it's nice and cool, except when the rains or the fog comes in. Um, and it also is important in terms of our history. Uh, there were at least one important Civil War battles that were fought near Catawba Mountain. In fact, one of the areas that I wanted to move to Virginia was to learn more about the Civil War. I've also been to Tennessee and learned that often it was the geology that made or break uh, the, uh, the outcome of that event. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the details of that battle, but I do know that there were some that were for them. All right, so here's a quick overview of the geology of, um, of Catawba Mountain. So on the south side of the mountain, um, as you get off Route 81, for those of you familiar with the area, that's the main interstate through Virginia, um, you run into these rocks. These are carboniferous rocks that formed, I would say, somewhere between about 280 to 250 million years ago. Um, they represent some of the youngest sediments that are located in the Appalachian Valley. Uh, they consist of mostly siltstones and sandstones. Um, as you go further up into the Carboniferous, you can get coals, you can get conglomerates. Uh, this represents the very end of the time of, of the marine deposition in Virginia. And one of the things that you may notice is, if you follow the layers, that they sort of curve. These are, these are strongly folded. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, this was the site where... Um, Africa and North America slammed together, forming Pangaea. Um, so we can we can see it here in terms of the geology. So uh, by the way, there are no fossils in this. Uh, these are all um, pretty very shallow sediments, non-marine. All right, and here is a picture. You may need to zoom in on this. I, sorry for it being so small. But um, this is one of the major cliffs, again, on the south side of Catawba Mountain. And what's nice here is you can see Carboniferous Age rocks at the top. 
Um, and then there's some late Devonian rocks that are at the bottom. And I put a, a, a red line right between the Carboniferous and the Devonian, late Devonian. This is the site of a major mass extinction. For years, I've collected from the rocks here. And there's a very sharp contrast between the uh, shallow marine sediments at the bottom. Uh, you, get brach you get lots of brachiopods. You get uh, clams, lots of clams in the sequence. In fact, uh, I would guess it was about 30 years ago, I was collecting fossils with uh, some of my students, came across a very rare conularid fossil, which um, I immediately recognized from Cornell, the days I was at Cornell. Conularids are these weird jellyfish that had a thin chitinophosphatic shell to them, just enough for some of them to be preserved. They're very rare in the fossil record. Uh, as far as I know, that's the only one that's ever been found in um, the state of Virginia. Uh, it was in my personal collection for many years, and then I realized that, uh, that it really needed a more prominent place, so I donated it to Virginia Tech's geology program so they could do research on it. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is the sharp contrast in organisms from very fossiliferous layers in the late Devonian to almost nothing here in the Carboniferous. Uh, so something uh, happened. Now we do have some fossils in the uh, uh, in the in the Carboniferous. Uh, there are some brachiopods. There's some, this thing called spirifer um, that is present, but you have to go to other areas to find these things. All right, so here's where we get to sort of the meat of the of the lecture. The, the, the mass extinction event that I've spent the most time studying is the late Ordovician to uh, Silurian one about 444 million years ago. Catawba Mountain has one of the best exposures where you can go right through the Ordovician um, into, the, uh, into the Silurian. Uh, and it's marked by a very sharp contrast by rock types. Uh, the ones on the left are late Ordovician. They are dirty sandstones, very shallow water sediments. And then the ones on the right are these nice, clean Silurian sandstones and thick conglomerate beds um, at the bottom. So there's a dramatic change in terms of the geology that we see along Catawba Mountain. So here's a little close up, a, be a better image of some of these sandstones and conglomerates that are there. Um, very shallow water, possibly non-marine sediments that we see. All right, as we move down the, uh, the outcrop, uh, there, the rocks go from these conglomerates, conglomerates, by the way, are these sort of pebbly, sandy units in the Silurian. Uh, below that is the late Ordovician, the dirty sandstones. Then as you go below that, uh, you get into sandstone shales and limestones. And further down the sequence, you get uh, nice, clean limestones. In fact, I didn't show it here, but uh, uh, this, well, this site is, is obviously well visited by geologists. We have the evidence for that. Number of beer bottles and containers all on the outcrop uh, that people have left behind, unfortunately. Um, but uh, what I was saying is, beyond the Martinsburg Formation, if you keep going down, yeah, yeah, what can I say? Um, as you go further down below the Martinsburg Formation, the late Ordovician, uh, you get into these um, sort of purple-green siltstones and shales, which have been interpreted as continental slope deposits. Below that is the, uh, the I think, believe it's late Ordovician, yeah, late Ordovician um, shales. So you go from basically these deep, basinal deposits, very deep tectonic, probably produced by a tectonic hinge. Um, and then it becomes progressively shallower as you go along. All right, this table summarizes some of the work that I've done this summer. Um, one of the things that we're able to do is using some very careful measurements of the thickness of these layers, um, we can come up with and do sedimentary rate calculations. So we can tie that into the data from um, the uh, absolute geologic time scale. And I'm able to refine some of these zones. So we recognize now that there's at least, uh, I think there's at least three biostrata zones that are present on uh, the Taba Mountain. 
and I've listed them there. Uh, there's the glypnoglycella zone, which is mostly a lingulate. There's raphnosquina, which you've seen before, and then there's diplograptus, which is a graptolite. I also showed you a picture of that earlier on. I'm going to show it to you again in case you forgot. Um, I'm showing the thickness of those in meters. Uh, notice also the rock. This is important. The, the geology, how that change is going up. So at the very bottom, we have these nice, clean, deep water limestones. Then as we go up, they get somewhat shallower sandstones and shales. Uh, and then at the very top of the, uh, the Martinsburg, you get these dirty sandstones that, that are very shallow water. Um, and then you go into the Silurian, which are nice, clean sandstones and conglomerates, beach sandstones, if you will. Um, in the last column, I've given the age of millions of years so between the sedimentary rate calculations and the radiometric dating, we're, we're getting this down to probably a couple of million years, which is pretty cool when you think about it. We're going back almost a half a billion years, and we can get resolution of deep time on the order of a couple of million years. That's not bad, all right, uh, for these zones. All right, so for those of you that don't remember, um, here's what... Uh, Here's what the major changes that are going on in the late Ordovician that I see on Catawba map. And like I said, there's, a t there's lots of data. Uh, one of the things that's nice is the Springer PhD dissertation that was done, uh, this guy that did his, his PhD work at Virginia Tech uh, is now available online. And a lot of the information collected is in the form of an appendix in fact that just basically needs to be put into a computer somewhere. But I'm, I'm going to summarize uh, what Springer has said here and also what Alicia Steigel has said. And basically what we see at the late bottom of the late Ordovician is you have all these graptolites. These are things, oh, if you're not familiar, they look like pencil markings on the rock. Uh, but they were actually sort of a, either a planktonic organism, sort of like a jellyfish, or they were benthonic and they lived on the bottom. So you have these all along the bedding plates, you see lots of these graptolites. Then as you go up, the planktonic graptolites, and even some of the free-swimming uh, squid-like organisms, they tend to die out. Um, and it's not clear in my mind why that would happen. I mean, certainly these things were able to travel over great distances. I've talked to other experts. The feeling is that there was some kind of change in the chemistry of the oceans that was going on that may have had the peck on them. Um, toward the middle of the late Devonian, the Ordovician, you see these uh, very flat strophomeid brachiopods in the middle left-hand side of the slide. They're, they're all over the bedding plains. All right? They were extremely abundant. I mean, it was a simple way of life. You know, you just lived on the bottom of the sea floor, and then you open up your shells, and you take in water, you take in oxygen, and you got everything you need to survive, okay, except for one little problem. All right, and that one little problem are clams. Okay, towards the middle of the Ordovician, during the middle of this what's called Cadian period, clams start coming in in force. And I've shown you one in the uh, sort of lower, well, it's the middle right-hand side there. Uh, that's Madia lopus, and it's a pretty good-sized clam. It's about, um, I would say, six to seven centimeters across. And these things were informal when they come in. These are the invasive species of the Ordovician, right? And, you know, we tend to think, I'm going to use some environmental terms here, we tend to think of invasive species as carnivores, maybe things like a, 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 a lionfish, or if that's the right term, things that come in, they just start attacking the native species who have no resistance and they just die. But back in the middle of Ordovician, there were carnivores, I'm going to talk about them in a minute, but I think the bigger problem was these clams, they started coming in, and they just start churning up the up churning up the sediment on the bottom of the seafloor, making it extremely unstable for things like the like the, the strophomeans, uh specifically raphnosquina that we see right next to it. And if you're used to laying on the bottom of the seafloor and opening up your shell and taking in uh, oxygen and food, that's okay. But once you get into sediment, even a centimeter or two buried, now you open up your shell. Instead of getting food and oxygen, you get mud. And the lophophore, the main organism, organ in these things that you use to separate out the food and the oxygen from other stuff, just gets clogged, and they're dead. And so what we see, 
as you go up the stratigraphic record, stratigraphic record is dramatic change in the fauna at the very top of the Morrinsburg, at the very end of the late Ordovician on Catawba Mountain. Okay, what you have here is uh, these lingulate, lingular looking brachiopods, um, which they were originally called lingula. Um, I've decided to call them glyphosella. Uh, paleontologists these days are just saying 450 million years is too long for a genus to survive. So they're, they're starting to break it down and put different names on them. Um, but glyphosella, right, thank you, tagline. Uh, lingula, translated out of the Latin, basically means tongue. These are things that sort of have, a, if you look at your pinky, look at the fingernail on your pinky, um, they sort of have an oval shape like that, um, and that's perfect design for if you want to if you want to dig into the sediment, and that's what was essential at the end of the Ordovician for survival, is that you could burrow into the sediment that you didn't have to live on top of the sediment, and think of the advantages that 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 gives you. Basically, what it means is that you can hide from predators. It doesn't matter whether the sediment's being churned around or not because you don't care. Um, in many cases, these lingulates had a muscle that allowed them to dig into the sediment and anchor themselves in. So even if you're, you know, you have waves and currents coming along and digging you out, you can still anchor yourself somewhat because one of the big problems in near shore areas is you don't want your shell picked up, bashed against a rock, and all your soft parts hanging out for whatever unfriendly predator happened to be in the environment. And and there certainly were some nasty predators around. We certainly know that. There were uh, cephalopods, squids, armored uh, cephalopods back then that were probably ravenous uh, feeders. We know that probably there were some snails back then. You had your reptrids, uh, these sort of sea scorpions that were going around that were hungry. So um, definitely you had to worry about uh, predation coming in. All right. So one of the problems that I ran into is, unfortunately, there is an unconformity. There is a gap in the geologic record at Catawba Mountain between the very end of the Martinsburg and the very beginning of the Silurian. And it's a, we estimate it's about a six million year gap. And it's right at the crucial time where the late Ordovician is terminating and the Silurian is starting. And what do you do? I mean, when you run into something, well, go look for more rocks. So I got in my car and I drove the Haters Gap which is in the southwest part of Virginia, and decided to spend a day on Hayter's Gap. And there's a nice, uh, more complete sequence of rocks uh, right from the top of the Martinsburg right to the bottom of the Silurian. And I was able to collect from there. And what I found was this, um, non-marine sediments, okay, no fossils in them other than maybe a worm tube or something like that. Uh, but clearly, I would say by about 400 and, uh, let's say, 450 million years ago, um, a lot of the oceans in Virginia were just cleaned out of marine organisms. Maybe they were there in other places. Certainly, they survived to give rise to, to the marine organisms in the Silurian. Uh, but uh, in Virginia, they were mostly gone. Okay, the, the water was very shallow. And finally, I have a question. Good. Bergen asked, does non-marine mean the layer was lifted above water for a spell? Um, I would think so. These are either um, very shallow water deposits. I, would even, I wouldn't even say shallow water. I would say above, uh, above the water level as, as well to, to get these because there's a lot of iron in these, which means that you had to be below the atmosphere to have the oxygen mixing in with the form the hematite. If it's shallow water, you're going to get things like uh, ripple marks and so on, which you see in the Silurian. So I essentially think that this was was pretty much above water, or maybe an intertidal zone. All right, so here's my uh, conclusions about what was probably the result of the late Ordovician extinction based upon what I see here in Virginia. Um, there's a clear, classic, regressive sequence in the geology. So there was definitely a drop in sea level. Um, there was an influx of clastic sediments towards the, towards the end. Um, there's clear evidence in, of glaciation in Africa. Um, and colleagues that have, have worked in Europe and, Af and have gone to Africa have documented these tillite deposits or glacial deposits in Africa. Uh, what that meant
meant is that as the glaciers started to form in Africa, you would have had a, a eustatic, a global wide drop in sea level, which would have drained many of these continental shelves, producing the regressive sequence that we see in Virginia. There was an introduction of informal clams um, into Virginia um, and, and other parts of basins um, that would have uh, bioturbated the sediment, created instability of the seafloor, killing off epifaunal organisms that were used to living right on the bottom of the seafloor. We know that there were carnivorous organisms such as uh, squids, uh, sea scorpions, uh, some fish were coming around back then, um, so it would have been difficult to uh, uh, to survive. And there's one more thing that we that's very clear that I haven't talked about yet um, on uh, Taba Mountain bentonite deposits, all through from the Ordovician right into the Silurian, and they get even thicker in the Silurian. We know that um, there was North America. We call that actually Laurentia. And there was a continental shelf around Laurentia. Then off the coast of North America, there was a volcanic island arc. In fact, probably the best way to try and visualize this is think of Japan off the coast of Asia. That's what North America would have looked like about 450 million years ago. And the volcanoes in that volcanic island arc were very active, shooting off um, ash layers, pyroclastic flows, going into the oceans, I mean, the late Ordovician was just not a good time to live, okay, for a marine organism. Uh, it was very difficult during that time period. And that's the end of my presentation. I've left about 15 to 18 more minutes for those of you that have questions. Be happy to answer them. Uh, yes, Af that's true. Uh, Africa uh, was connected to South America, Antarctica, and India. In, uh, the, uh, in the in the uh, Ordovician, and you're right, it would have been close to the South Pole, so it would have been easier for um, for glaciers to form. Adriana, good to see you again. I hope you had a good summer. And Erica, I'm glad you were able to attend as well. Yeah, I'm going to check that out, Vic. Yeah. One of my, uh, one of the graduate students, uh, Chris Cotese, was in Chicago when I was going through graduate school, and he had a map showing current latitude and longitudes on his paleogeographic reconstructions. All right, so we have a question. Are there any theories on the cause of the six million year gap between those areas, just quirks of the geology? Yeah, um, absolutely, uh, goat the devil. Um, it's like anything, you know, there's some areas that are underwater um, or that preserve the rock record, and there are some where you have lots of, uh, and, and so when you have an unconformity like this, there's always the question in your mind, is it due to non-deposition of sediment, okay, where you just don't have enough sediment coming in to preserve the, preserve the geologic record? Or the other option is that the sediment was deposited and that was eroded, and we just don't know. Um, let's see, and we have, that's what's amazing. These are mountains, but they used to be sea beds. Oh yeah, um, you know, in Virginia, uh, typically those sedimentary rock layers are a couple of thousand, uh, a thousand feet above sea level. Um, if you talk about the Himalayas, which are five miles above sea level, uh, that was underwater as well. So, yeah, I mean, I'm in awe at how powerful plate tectonics is. And the other thing that we've learned is it doesn't take a long time, geologically speaking, a couple of million years to make a mountain range and chain and raise uh, seafloor sediments to the top of mountains. Matrices in Euclidean space. I'm not sure what tagline is getting at there. I wonder how many, uh, how much a slowing or shutdown of ocean currents played in previous extinctions. Did you have any findings on that? Um, Adrian, there have been a lot of attempts to reconstruct ocean currents in the past. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. If Alicia Steigl was here, she would absolutely say that ocean currents were extremely important. Certainly introducing um, 
invasive species like Montiolopus into different basins would be important. Because if you think about it, adult clams are sessile. They, they just settle down from the water column and they're there. Um, they don't move around. The only way that the currents can drift an invasive species like the clam is as the larval state. So that would certainly be important. Um, and I can also think of certainly other ways ocean currents would impact, for example, controlling the temperature distributions within the oceans, distribution of nutrients. I think you're absolutely right that understanding ocean currents, and there are a number of reconstructions of them in the past, would be important. Uh, let's see, given. Yeah, um, Mike says, given how much we know of the geologic record, it's not surprising that there are gaps. There's lots of gaps. If you look at the Grand Canyon, there's a classic example where you see lots of these unconformities. Almost all the Ordovician Silurian is cut out of the Grand Canyon because there just was no deposition that was going on there. And really the way geologists work is it's like a it's literally like a big jigsaw puzzle. You go around to different places and you try and figure out which pieces of the puzzle you're looking at and you try and tie them together to make a, a, a one large um, geologic column or time scale from all these little pieces. Let's see, Vic saying, realizing that tectonic plates and mountains below sea level and that all has been really accepted in my lifetime. <laughs> That's the other thing, yeah. Uh, within my lifetime, there's been a dramatic shift from, oh, the continents don't move. That was when I was born in the 1950s too. Well, of course, the continents move. They're part of these larger plates that have been sliding around. All right, Baragon asked, could glaciers scrape away a few million years of layers? Certainly, that's true. Um, don't have any evidence. The, the only evidence for glaciers in Virginia, you got to go back a billion years. Certainly not the Ordovician, um, because we, we were just at the wrong location. Uh, you've got to go back a billion years to the snowball Earth time when the planet froze over, and that hasn't happened since then. So certainly glaciers in higher latitudes or higher elevations could scrape away a lot of the rock record. They're extremely powerful bulldozers. Uh, in my mind, one of the, I'm more worried about uh, the role that humans are playing, uh, and I've been working in a quarry with uh, Susan Leibel from the uh, – from the Smithsonian, and one of the things I'm worried about is how humans are destroying our, our rack record. Um, my, my way of looking at geology has changed. It used to be when I first started, oh, let's go out, have students collect fossils, and it's fun, and so on. And now what I'm worried about is that a lot of the classic um, localities, geologic locations, in the United States are just being destroyed through either the Department of Transportation going in and removing these these slopes because they're afraid the rocks are going to come down, or commercial collectors going in and scraping every last brachiopod off the rock. You know, take your pick, or weathering and erosion. And so now my priority is to go around and try and document. Uh, I would say uh, Catawba Mountain is, is probably the last of the good exposures of the, uh, the, the Paleozoic in Virginia. What used to be present, I would say, you know, in the 70s and 80s, like Hayter's Gap, um, they're gone. I mean, when I went there, I couldn't find any fossils at all. And at one time, they were very fossiliferous. So what I'm trying to do for the Virginia Museum of Natural History is go through, collect key beds. I look at what we don't have collections of, go out into the, into the field, collect them, document them, uh, identify them, and put them in museums so that future generations will still be able to study this stuff. And Tagline says, we need to let mining and petroleum companies develop national parks, vacant federal lands in the U.S., of course. That's important personal. I, I detect a sense of skepticism from Tagline here, um, a music effort. Department of Transportation, local site. Yeah, one of the things that I'd really like to see have happen is the Department of Transportation's work more with geologists. And I think there's some interest there. I was up at uh, in Pennsylvania and talked to um, 
some of the, the people up there. And I think there is interest because there are some spots that are really rich in fossils. And the problem is that a lot of governments are just saying, we don't want you working along the side of, a, of, of some of these interstates because it's just downright dangerous. The traffic is going by at 55, 60 miles an hour. It's not like in the 40s and 50s when cars, you know, you pull up, pull the, you pull your Model T Ford to the side of the road and people slowly and carefully went around you when you're doing field geology. Now there is a, there is a, a danger of you getting hit and that's it, you're dead. Okay, if it's on some of these interstates and that's sort of in the back of my mind is, is always a problem or always a danger. Uh, do you have any more questions about the presentation? And I presume the video is going to be posted on online, right, uh, Jess or uh, Chantel? Great. All right. Yeah. Um, Adrian, you are absolutely right. I never used to wear a flak vest anymore, but more and more they're saying you have to these day and age. And like in the quarry. That is a great idea, Chantel. That's something that I wanted to do is sort of global geology. Um, if people would go into their backyard, you know, if you pass by an interesting rock outcrop and you can safely take a picture of it and tell me where it is, I think that would be real interest to discuss that. So what major animal or plant which came after? All right. So Vic's asking, so what replaced, you know, in the Ordovician we have, um, Mostly they're dominated by this brachiopod rapidus guina. We have diplograptids, which are uh, graptolites that have two openings on both sides. Um, in the Silurian, what we see is new brachiopods coming on the scene. There are these things called pentamerids, which have a very different shape. And guess what? They're designed for living in the sediment. No surprise, okay, based on what I've said. Um, you also get what a, a different type of graptolite coming back called the monograptids. Um, you get lots of eryptrids or sea scorpions. They seem to be doing quite well, but they're, they're swimmers. Um, you basically get a change in the, in the, in the bio, biota in the oceans. Oh, the Jura Mountains, right. Cass, I remember we've talked about that. Uh, lovely Cass, I'd love to see more pictures from you about that. That'd be, and I've even talked to her about doing a joint presentation on uh, the Jura Mounts, which are very famous, geologically speaking. Yeah, I figured Tagline's going to say that. Um, well, yeah, one of the things I forgot to put in here is my email address, so let's do that. There you go. Feel free to email me, and maybe we need to put together some kind of pending. I don't know how we do it. But I think that would be a lot of fun, uh, would be to look at pictures from different plants and tie part of the plant and sort of tie that into uh, the geology. And before we all run off, because I know we're getting close to, we try and keep these to an hour. Um, but I, uh, I want to make a, a quick blurb. I'm giving another lecture, not uh, on the Science Circle, but September 23rd. I'm part of VISTI, the Virginia Society of Technology and Education. I'm going to be talking about virtual reality and education. So, um, and I know time zones are a problem. Uh, that presentation is going to be at 5 p.m. Uh, SLT time. So I know people in Australia and Asia and Europe, that's going to be a problem for Jess. But um, if, you, um, if you are able to come, that would be great on the VISTI sim. And uh, I know Vic already said he has an interest in that. So if you're interested in virtual reality and how it could be used in schools, please come. That is September 23rd, 5 p.m. SLT, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time at 7 Central for Vic. It'll be on the VISTI sim. And feel free to, uh, to say if you're interested in coming to that, be happy to give you the LM. Uh, it's on the mainland VISTI just moved from uh, their own island to a smaller sim, mainly to save some money, but we're trying to get more people showing up with those. And I thank you all for coming.
yes tagline. It's uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daily Time or Second Life Time. And again, if you need a uh, if you need a landmark, let me know. I'll be happy to drop you one. Or well, you know, just come on that time. You know, I'll TP you to it. Yeah, that the September twenty third presentation is um, not here at Science Circle. It's going to be at uh, the Vista Center. Again, if you're interested, let me know. I'll I'll drop you the location. Okay, I sent one to an LM to taglines. Anybody else that want it wants it for September twenty third. All right, well, um, hope all of you have a good day or a good night, depending where you are. And again, thanks for coming.